5. And it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. The bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. These are the activities and situations that's going on and taking place um, with Moses while he's in the desert. Now, as a little kid, as a, as a little kid, when I thought about the desert, I'm not going to even lie, I was really kind of taken back by the desert. When I saw the desert, I think one of my first, I guess, experiences with, with deserts was watching, you know, Wally Coyote and, you know, the Roadrunner and stuff like that. The thing that I noticed was it was nobody out there except the both of them. And so it looked very lonely. It looked very, like, just empty. And, I, and so ever since then, I always looked at deserts in a, in a pretty, like, horrible, like, kind of, like, a standoffish way. I never wanted to be at a desert. I remember going to Texas one time. I just didn't even like it, the snakes and stuff like that. And so for this sermon, I actually took time to do amazing, extensive, intense, crazy research. I did some heavy research, and uh, I went on to um, I went on to Desert Facts for Kids, and um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on Desert Facts for Kids, and um, you know, you you, you got you, you got to do this intense study, and I found out some um, some different facts about deserts, um, just straight to the point. It says. Um, there are a number of different definitions to describe a desert, but there are typically areas that receive extremely low amounts of rain. About one third of the Earth's surface is covered in deserts. Deserts generally receive less than six inches of rain an entire year. Only 20% of the deserts on Earth are covered in sand. I didn't really know that. The largest cold desert on the Earth, does anybody know? Yes, absolutely, Antarctica. Largest cold desert, so if you ever get that on the test kids and everything like that, tell them you learned it at church. It's Antarctica, the largest cold desert. The largest hot desert on Earth is? All right, all right, we got it. I didn't know that at first, y'all yeah, um, With deserts, typically with hot deserts, during the day, it is incredibly hot, but at night, it can get extremely cold. And the last, the last fact is that with lack of water, high daytime temperatures, and sometimes freezing conditions at night, deserts can be extremely dangerous places for humans. Um, if you guys will give me a few moments of your time, I would like to title this message I found my destiny in the desert. I found my destiny in the desert. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you. And after all those facts, um, to be honest, it's quite difficult to see how you can produce anything um, out of the desert. Um, but we serve a God in which people question and ask, can anything good be produced out of Nazareth? You did good on that promise. You did good on that. And so, God, we ask that you please just open our eyes and you bring us through this trip, God, to allow us to know that we can find amazing things. We can find the purpose that you have for us in the most craziest situations. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I found my destiny in the desert. I found my destiny in the desert. I started writing and pinning this thing down after seeing a lot of my friends go through a lot of different trials and different situations in which um, 
they just had lost all hope. And one of the things that I found out in the Bible is a reoccurring theme, but it seems like in the Bible, it seems like that God usually shows his might in the most craziest situations, in the most craziest places, in the most desolate of places, with the most unlikely of people. And if there was ever a list of people that could go onto that list of God doing amazing things through and being unlikely, it would have to be Moses. Moses, when we come in, when we, oh, when, we, when we enter into Exodus, Exodus basically being the part two of Genesis, Genesis just being the first book, and then as we leave Genesis, we see these people who, they, when they come to Egypt, and they're, now they're having all this food, they, they, they were running from a famine, they're coming and having this abundance of food and all of these things, and that's the end of Genesis, that's happening at the end of Genesis, we as we're closing in Genesis, as we're closing through Genesis, we see these people having a great time, and that's Genesis closing. And then we have this upcoming, this book, it's the sequel. And in this sequel, basically what happens, what takes place is, eventually the children of Israel become very heavily numbered. And so the, the Egyptian says, man, one day these people can become so numbered, they can outnumber us, and overthrow this land one day. They can rebel against us. So let's put them in bondage. Let's put these people in bondage because if we don't, they can do something that would overtake our, our, our entire government, overthrow the entire government, and they will completely rule. They will completely rule if this happened. Out of fear, they put them in bondage. They put them in slavery. And so... Eventually this happens throughout years and years and years, and eventually um, the Pharaoh comes out with a decree saying, I want you guys to kill the children, the firstborn or, 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 or a child, in order to do population check. So basically he's trying to cut down the population even more. So he says, like, man, kill these kids, things like that. At that time, Moses, he is born. His mother, she takes a man and she hides him. She hides him for a few months, but then when he's too big or whatnot, she thinks he's, he's too old to be hidden, she puts him in this little basket and she puts him down a river. Her, his sister looks nearby and tries to find out where this basket actually goes, and it leads up to the daughter of Pharaoh. It leads up to her. The daughter of Pharaoh gives Moses over to some Hebrew women to take care of him until he's 12. And then when he's 12, He's now called the son of the daughter of Egypt, the prince of Egypt. Now, we just look at it as prince of Egypt. We probably look at the, you know, the show. I talked to you guys, um, you know, months ago about how that's one of my favorite um, movies and things like that. But you honestly have to kind of put yourself in the picture of being the prince of Egypt. This man, this man was trained in all rights at the at the at the highest institutions. Like, like Harvard, we're talking about Yale at that time. Like finding out about so many different things. <clears throat> finding out about civil matters and military might and so many different things. This man has went to the crime that I crime, I don't know if I said it right, but he went to a really, he had an amazing education. He walked through the palaces. He, he had an amazing shower. He really didn't even have to feed himself. He got people feed him, you know, yeah. didn't pop, you know. I have a grape in his mouth. He didn't, he didn't have to feed himself. <laughs> this man was living lovely, and not only was he living lovely, the daughter was trying to get him next on the throne. So at all rights and purposes, <clears throat> he was supposed to be the next successor. Moses could have been the next pharaoh. Could have been the next pharaoh down this line in which the daughter of um, Pharaoh was trying to get him to be. And this is what's happening to Moses. However, during that time, when he's growing up to the age of 12, he hears about the desperation. He hears about what his people are going through. He hears about the God that can deliver. He hears about all these different things, and now he has a heart. He has a heart for his people to actually be free. He wants his people to be free. And it's this Moses that we come in now into this sermon, into this, into this series, into this, into this story. He comes in, and now he finds out more about his destiny. He hears about the fact that in Genesis, and God had promised basically that they would be free, they would leave 
Egypt eventually. He finds out all these things. However, however, Moses tries to take matters in his own hands. He tries to take matters in his own hands. Moses, he finds out that an Egyptian guard is mistreating one of the Israelites. And he takes matters into his own hands by force. He attacks the Israelite guard. He attacks the Israelite guard and he kills him. He murders the man. Eventually, as he's as he's running, as he's running, you know, people didn't really notice that he did anything or whatnot. He's running and he goes back home and probably just goes through life and things like that. Eventually he sees two other Israelites that are going against each other. They're, they're arguing, they're fussing with each other and things like that. And so he tries to talk to them and break them up. He says, man, why are you guys going against each other? And then they say, man, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptians? So now he finds out, he finds out that everybody else knows. Eventually Pharaoh knows and he wants, he wants Moses dead. And so Moses, now he runs. And this is basically just going through the story of Moses. I'm going to go through the story of Moses today for you guys. Because sometimes we, we look at stuff in the Bible and we'll just like, man, just concentrate on that thing. You ever read through something really fast? And then like you probably read through it again and say, man, I didn't even notice that. But you read through it like a long time ago. We're going to actually look through like the life of Moses. And we're going to look at the life of Moses and how this desert changed his life. But the first question that happens, the first question that I have for you and what occurs to Moses is that he ends up going to the desert, but he doesn't go to the desert because of God. He doesn't go to the desert because of God. God doesn't send him to the desert, nor does he go to the desert because he did something that God wanted him to do. God never said that he, that he wanted him to take the Egyptians down by force. As a matter of fact, a commentator says that it was never God's intention to take the Egyptians down by force. It was never his intention to take the Egyptians down by force. However, Moses, in his own ideas, he said, look, I am going to put things into my own hands, and he kills the Egyptian. What happens when you're the cause of your own death? What happens when you are the cause for your own death? God, I, I'm struggling with, with paying this bill. I'm struggling with paying the rent, but I've got to be honest with myself. I've got to be honest with myself, God. I, I, man, I saw that nice, them nice shoes, the nice heels. I saw, saw them clothes. I wanted to, you know, splurge a little bit. I was out of town, and now I'm in my own desert. God, I, I got into this relationship and I, something told me, you didn't even tell me to get into the relationship. Something told me that this relationship was not going to be so well, but now this person has damaged my trust and now I have trust issues in my current relationship. God, why is desert right now? God, I hung around this circle of friends and you had people come in my life and tell me not to hang around those friends, but now every time I tell them about my dreams, every time I tell them about my goals and my aspirations, they shut them down. They laugh at me. And now I'm 10 years down, not even going to college, not doing anything with my life because my friends told me not to. God, why did I get myself in this desert? Many times we hear about the stories of the people who Man, do amazing things for God, and they stand up for God, and they end up getting in these crazy situations. But what about the ones who get themselves into the situation? I want to talk to you today the people who, the people who doesn't, who don't give all their testimony because they know they did something wrong in their testimony. <laughs> the people who give the half story. Say, oh, yeah, I mean, God saved me from this, 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 and this, but we don't say the origin of that thing. We don't say how that happened. <laughs> I want to talk to those people today. <clears throat> what happens when we get ourselves into our own deserts? I can tell you, you can rest assured that God has you even when you get your own self into situations. Amen. Know that when God is dealing with a desert situation, he knows three things about your situation. One, he knows the situation. He knows what's going on. He knows what's in your life. He knows the people in your life. He knows the people that's going to approach you eventually. He knows the people that's going to down your dreams. He knows the people that are going to discourage you. He knows the people that's going to uplift you. He knows the entire realm of the situation. But not only does he know the situation, he knows you. There you go. <laughs> One of the biggest things 
things I learned from being in college. Many of my friends would say that every time, every time they would sin, when they would sin horribly, they wouldn't talk to God for a few days. And they wouldn't talk to God for a few days because they thought that God was disappointed. Well, this should come to great news to you because God's not disappointed in your mess up. God's not surprised. A lot of times we have this picture that when we mess up, God's like, oh my goodness. Uh, I, this. I was not expecting this to happen. No, God knew you. He had plans for you. And in the middle of him having those plans, he saw some of the mess that you was going to do. He knows your situation, but he also knows you. He knows about the money he gave you, and he also knows that you was not going to give it to Ty. He knows that person he put in your life, and he also knew that you were going to treat that person wrong. You are going to take advantage of that person. He gave you the blessing of college or that job, and he knew that you were going to squander it all. And that is a great thing to know that once we mess up, God is not surprised at us. But not only does God know our situations, not only does God know us, but God knows himself. I remember one minister, he said, when I was at Oakwood, he said, man, when God bought us, he gave this illustration. He said, when God bought us, he bought us almost as if somebody came to a car dealership and they saw the lemon and they actually bought the lemon. He knew you were going to be messed up. However, God knew that he could fix you up. God knew that he was a redeemer. God knew that he could change you up. God knew that he could do big things in your life. God did not get into this situation with you and have this marriage with you and call you a believer and call you his son and call you his daughter saying, that, oh, man, I'm not going to be able to take care of this person. He knows your situation. He knows your failures. And he's also ready to compensate you. The whole sin situation, that's not a big deal for him. It's getting you in the relationship with him that matters right now. The fact that our sin separates us because sometimes we feel so guilty that we try to separate ourselves from God. And that's exactly what Moses did. He runs to Midian. And it's crazy, right? It's crazy. This is, this is the crazy part about Midian. Desert, the original meaning of desert, I found this out from the fun facts for kids means a desolate place. However, Midian means strife. So from a bad situation, Moses runs towards strife. And that's many of us in our lives. So to get out of a bad situation, we run away from God, we don't talk to God, we don't, we don't handle, we don't hash it out with God, and we run towards something else. We get from bad to worse. We may have that bad situation in jobs, or we may, and then we run to drugs, or we run to alcohol, or we run to that friend that knows they're going to tell us all the things we want to hear and never challenge us. <laughs> we run from bad to worse. And Moses, he runs from Egypt to Midian. In strife. Have you ever been in strife? Contention or other, and fighting are the other definitions for this desert. However, Moses, while he's in the midst of strife, while he's in the midst of contention, while he's in the midst of his mess, Moses does something very different. While he's still in the midst of his strife, he remains faithful. The Bible says that as Moses is running into Midian, he runs and he sits down by a well. Now, Moses doesn't know these people, but seven women, they walk up. They walk up to the well to get water, and shepherds, they come in, and they try to attack them. They try to attack them and scare them away. Now, even though Moses is a fugitive, even though Moses is wanted for murder, even though <coughs> Moses could die if he is caught, Moses still stayed, and he remains faithful. And that's a word already right there, because... Man, us as a Christian church, us as a church, we are called to remain faithful in the midst of strife. One of the biggest things that I detest in church sometimes is when people come into church. When people come into church and because their week was bad, they want to pour it out loud on everybody else. You had that one person that walks by you and they don't even say anything. 
It's because they're upset. It's because they're upset. And God knows in that person's heart they have words that they can encourage somebody with. But because they're going through strife, because they're going through things, it's not, it's not about God anymore. It's all about them. And they shield up. They don't become faithful. Check this out. Moses goes and he attacks the shepherds, scaring the shepherds away. He scares the shepherds away from the seven women. The seven women, they go back. Now the seven women, the seven women, <coughs> father, his name is Jethro. Seven women come back and say, Dad, like, this man like saved us. He was like, oh, y'all didn't come through and give him a plate to eat or anything like that? Y'all ain't Y'all ain't give them no food or nothing like that? Y'all ain't bring them through or anything like that? Y'all, can y'all get them, please? So they go back and they find Moses and they bring Moses back. They bring Moses back to the house of Jethro. Now, in the midst of strife, they bring Moses to Jethro. Jethro uh, Moses runs to strife. He remains faithful in strife. And he ends up with Jethro. It was crazy because when I re researched the name of Jethro, it means abundance. It means excellence. In the midst of strife, through Moses remaining faithful and still loving and still helping others out, he ends up meeting excellence. He ends up meeting abundance in the midst of his strife. And for many of us as Christians, all we need to do is remain faithful. Remain faithful in our strife. Remain faithful in our struggle. And that's another reason why I'm so frustrated with, with Christians who try to have their own agenda and walk right past somebody when they're going through issues because that person you can you talk to could be the person that can give you your breakthrough. That could be the person that can give you your blessing. But we have our face all round up. Man, through strife, Moses finds abundance. Strike, Moses finds abundance. Jethro, he finds Jethro. And so he goes and he, he sees Jethro and Jethro's talking to him and everything like that. They're eating and stuff. And this man, Moses, he is so educated. He's educated in these in the disciplines of the Egyptian culture, and science at that time, something that we're still even reviewing even right now. We're still trying to figure out how pyramids were erected. <clears throat> we're still trying to find out so many different things in the Egyptian culture that he was taught easily. All these things he was given to easily. He was supposed to be the king. Getting ready to get set up for the king. Getting pampered and, pre and, and prepared to be the king of Egypt. He's talking to Jethro and Jethro's like, oh my goodness, Moses. Yo, look, uh, all right, you can stay here. You can stay here at Midian, and I got a job for you. And you got to be thinking, if you Moses, like, you know, wow, like, what job you got for me? You know, you don't have me second in command. You don't have me in command. You can just sit down. You know, what, what you going to have me do? You know, I, I, I do this. I've been going to school for this. You know, I, I, can, I can command and stuff like that. Jethro's like, well, it's something like that. I want you to lead. I want you to lead. I, I got you. I, I, I want you to lead. I got that part. I got, I, I got you right there. However, however, I want you to lead. Um, she, she, she. Yeah. You said, you said, huh? You, you said, you said, pe pe people? No, no, sheep. No, I need you to lead sheep. A sheep herd. I want. I want the once king or prince of Egypt, getting ready to be the pharaoh, to be a sheep herder, to, 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 to be around sheep. Like, I want you to walk with those things. Like, I want, I, want you to, I want you to talk to those things. I want you to watch them drink and eat and all that stuff. That's what I want you to do, Moses. That's what I want you to do. Are you for real? A shepherd. Moses is at the prime, basically, of his life. Forty years in Egypt, and now he, he was about to be <coughs> and the pharaoh. He's up here educated people. He don't got to work for, he don't got to work for anybody. People was working for him. He was walking around the palace. He had everything, and you want him to be a shepherd? 
What? Like you got all these distractions, your minds around it. This man has never in his life probably dreamed of ever being a shepherd. Never in his entire life dreamed of being a shepherd. However, God takes this person. He takes this person. And he says, look, I want you to be a sheep herder. What do you feel, how do you feel when, or what happens when you're placed in a situation in which you think that you are a sheep? <coughs> what happens when you're placed in a situation in which, uh, when God places you in a situation that you think you are above? You think you're overqualified? You think you're too dignified for this? You think that you shouldn't even be doing this? It feels like chores and you helping somebody out, but God has placed you right there. Moses had to wake up every morning. He had to watch the sheep. He had to watch the sheep go out to pasture, go and eat grass. He just had to watch them. <laughs> For the longest time, just all these sheep. And then he had to go and he had to lead them to drink and things like that. And so sometimes he had to bring them to a running stream and sometimes he had to dig, dig? I get manicures, manicures, is this? I, I, I gotta dig now? He has to dig, dig well sometimes if they didn't have access to water. At night he had to go and he had to count them and make sure everything was good, everything was well. Oh man, 100 sheep, I didn't know I had that. <laughs> and if one was to leave, if one was to leave, he would have to go and he had to go and find that, you know. Because sometimes you can tell sheep, you know, this is the right place to be, but sometimes they'll just end up, you know, on the missing members, I mean, missing sheep list. <laughs> and Moses, he, 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 he couldn't go and start talking about that sheep behind the other with the, behind that sheep's back to the other sheep that <laughs> decides to stay. No, he had to go and he had to find that one sheep. He had to go and he had to find that one sheep. He had to go and he had to find that one sheep. He couldn't just go and sit back and say, oh man, I told you about those sheep, man. They be just out there. <laughs> <laughs> Little God, did he know that God was doing something amazing in his life? Yes, sir. Sometimes God will place you situations in which you are overqualified, in which you are underestimated and overworked, and he will smile. And he will smile not because of the position where he's placed you, but he'll smile because of the person that he's making out of you. Yes. 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 Moses, he's thinking that he's just watching sheep eat. <laughs> that's all he thinks he's doing, but God, he's producing somebody that's going to pay attention. Moses thinks he's just waiting on sheep, but God is producing patience for some knucklehead Israelite. Yes. Moses thinks he's just digging up wells, but God is producing the heart of somebody who's going to provide for his people. Amen. Just like when you think that you're just living with a family that's always on your nerves, but God is producing a person that can't easily be annoyed. You think that you're just working a dead-end job while God is preparing a person in you who actually likes to work. Because at first you were so lazy that when you heard the word work, you would go to sleep. You think that you're suffering from that horrible relationship, but God is producing a person that can spot a clown a mile away. We need to stop looking at our deserts as our problems, but as God using this opportunity to do something in our lives that he could not do if you were anywhere else. But I believe, please believe that as much as God is working, Satan is working as well. And you can only imagine the words that Satan was saying to Moses as he's going through this situation. You a sheep herder? <laughs> this the person they was talking about? Oh, they said he was gonna deliver, you was gonna deliver people, right? Like, what, what happened with that? Is that like a, a little, what you doing with those sheep? Are you gonna deliver them with the sheep? How, how you gonna do that? <laughs> Moses right now, he's in his mind a has been. He's a has-been. But God uses this situation. He uses this situation. It's crazy because people's perspective of what you're going through and what you're doing, something like that, like it's, 
it gets difficult at times. I remember when I had a, a similar situation and I was um, in college. I think it was like my first year at Oakwood University and I went to college and everybody around St. Louis, they was like, oh man, Q, he went out of town. Not only did he go to a college, but he went to a college out of town. That was a big thing for us. And so I'll be walking around, people see pictures of me on Facebook, you know, being at college and stuff like that. So when I came back, I was like, hey, y'all, what's up? They was like, oh, big football star. I just went to college. It wasn't nothing there, you know. Yeah. It was like, oh, big Q, big Q. I'm like, yeah. People were like down the street. Hey, baby. I'm like, yeah. But all that stuff, I never met them. And <laughs> I used to work, before I came to Oakwood, I used to work at this, um, I used to work at the YMCA in St. Louis. I used to work at the YMCA in St. Louis. And I used to work helping out with like the different fitness equipment. I'll clean up the equipment, I'll be there to help people go in and stuff like that. And that was amazing, man, because I was just like, you know, I come in, you know, I have my shirt on, you know, probably some shorts, some like nice kicks, and I'll just be seeing people, and I'll be like, oh, hey, how y'all doing? Q got that cool job, and he gets to go to college and all that stuff. But then I came back after that first year in the old book. I needed a job. So I came back and I was hoping that they still had my position available. <laughs> so I came back and I was like, you know, yo, um, I, I, I just want to come back, you know, for my position. Y'all said come back anytime and stuff like that. They said, oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. All right, we have an issue. We, um, we, you can work, but we don't have that position ready for you. I was like, okay. Nothing. What y'all want me to do? Y'all want me to lifeguard, you know, something like that, you know, you know, I can swim, you know, do something like that. Y'all want me to be with the kids, you know, daycare or something. It's like, not exactly. We kind of we kind of want you to clean toilets. And I was like, oh. It's like you don't, you don't know what to say at that time. You're just like, oh. But you say oh just so you let them know that you, you know, you heard it. Environment caused this bush to burn. 
the environment did not cause it to be consumed. Mm -hmm. He says, wow, look at like this, this, this bush is in, is in, is burning, but it's not fully out. It's not fully burned. It's not fully consumed. And isn't that the essence of God sometimes? Isn't that the essence of God sometimes? God, through the Bible, back and forth, you can go and flip to almost any kind of story, but you'll constantly see the story of people who, are, who have been through the fire, but they have not been consumed. They've been through trials, but somehow they make it. It's a whole scripture that says, man, we're, we're crushed, but we're not consumed, or we're, or we're forsaken, but we're not cast away, or whatnot. He talks about these situations in which we are hurt, we are afflicted, we are pressed from each side, but we're not crushed, we're not taken fully out. We can be affected by our environment, but our environment does not consume us. Our environment does not snuff us out. Our environment does not kill us. This Moses that even though he's a fugitive, he's not dead. Even though he's out here, he doesn't know the survival skills of being out here in the desert. He, has, he hasn't had to live out in the desert, but he's still here. This Moses, that even though he's having these difficulties and these trials, he is still alive. He sees this burning bush. It's amazing how God can see us when we're depressed, when our loved one dies, but we're not consumed. When we throw in the towel, we think we're throwing in the towel after we had that child out of wedlock, and we forget about our dreams, but we're not consumed. We could have stopped our plans and aspirations when they talked and laughed at us, but we were not consumed. Man, God has an amazing way of allowing us to be in our environment, but not allowing our environment to overtake us. God, he talks to, he talks to um, Moses. And it's crazy because this is another danger of the desert situation. God talks to Moses and he says, look, Moses, I want you to free the people. I want you to be the instrument that I use to free the people out of Egypt. And after 40 years, Moses, he looks at this burning bush. He looks at the voice of God. He talks back to God and he says, who am I? One of our biggest issues with our desert situation that we believe we belong, we begin to believe that we belong in. Moses, the person who was so gung-ho and so focused on causing this whole liberation of, and overthrowing the government, almost to the point where he would kill somebody, now he's like, who am I? Man, I can't do that. I already tried it once. I already I messed up. I tried it once and it got me here with sheep. I don't want to try it again. I don't know where it's going to get me. It's amazing how sometimes our desert get to our minds in which we believe that's where we belong. However, God, he does something amazing. God doesn't say, oh, man, you're this, you're that, you're that. Because Moses is right. Who is he? He disrespected, basically, God. He didn't listen for God's advice. He didn't come to God. He'd been out with shepherds. He'd been out, you know, being a shepherd and things like that. He never came to God and all this situation occurred. He's not anything. He's not nobody to help um, help these people out. But God, instead of pointing to him and how great he is, he points to how great he is. He says, look, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. If you've ever been in that situation with the desert, the crazy part about the desert experience that I saw in reading this is that, man, his desert experience was 40 years old. He went through his desert experience for 40 years. I don't know how many of us and how long we've been in our desert situations. Some of us have probably been in our desert situations seem like our entire lives. However, when you ever get tempted to think that you are what your struggle is, begin to believe and begin to think about how good God is. Amen. I've read this in the entire situation with the with the desert experience, I read it and I asked myself, man, God, why did you bring him through this situation? I, I was reading in Ellen White about 
Moses, and she says something very profound that many of you guys already know from just reading the Bible and seeing how things happen with Moses. But man, she says that through the experience of Moses being in the desert, it prepared him to lead the children of Israel out of the wilderness. Because you can't lead nobody through something that you haven't been through yourself. Sometimes God will bring you through situations not because of you. Just take time to think about and put it in your mind that life is not about you all the time. Sometimes God will allow you to go through situations, go through trials, go through areas of life. He'll allow you to go through deserts so that you can help somebody else out. Because somebody else needs liberation. And they need help throughout the wilderness. And first he has to get you in the wilderness and through the wilderness so you can show somebody else out. God, he does that. I don't know why she says that. Through him being a shepherd, him being there and flocking and attending to the sheep and watching him. And because he was sitting down watching the sheep, now he can watch humans. He can make sure that he's accountable for them. Now when one human is, gets so frustrated and riled up that they want to leave, he can go back and look for that one person and try to resolve some kind of peace or something with them instead of going and talking about that person or getting frustrated himself. He can be a provider for those people because that's what he had been doing for 40 years of his life. 40 years of his life. God had prepared him for that situation. It reminds me of a situation of a of a situation or a story. Of this guy, you, many of you guys know, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, he had, um, let me move this up real quick, guys. Steve Jobs, he was speaking at a graduation. Um, he was giving the story of how Apple was created and things like that. And I'm, I'm like, oh. He was giving a story on how um, Apple created and things like that. And Steve Jobs drops out of college. He starts off basically talking about how he's dropping out of college. Now, mind you, he's at like college graduation. But he talks, he says, like, man, I dropped out of college, but this is one of the ways that Apple um, really got big and, and really got famous. He dropped out of school, he dropped out of college, but he remained at a certain class. He would go and he'll walk into the class, it was a calligraphy class. They would be talking about different fonts and stuff like that. And so he would just go to this class. He really liked calligraphy. He loved like drawing and stuff like that. He loved this thing with the different fonts. And so he comes and he learns so much about these fonts and he goes to this class. Now at this time, he does not know at all that this is going to help him out in his business. He doesn't know at all this is going to help him out with computers. He doesn't know at all. He's like, oh my goodness, it's a calligraphy class. I just really, I'm in it and I'm just going and I'm attending the class. Eventually he starts on you know, computers and he sees the computers and he says, man, what if we put different fonts to these computers? And so he puts the different fonts to the computers and people are seeing computers in a totally different way because they're like, oh my goodness, man, you can do Times New Roman, you can do Comic Sans, you can do all these different fonts in this particular computer. And from a situation in which Steve Jobs thought that was completely irrelevant to his particular job, his duty, and his burden, he ended up creating the type font. Right now, you would probably be, be typing in just one regular, one regular font if it wasn't for Steve Jobs. <laughs> Steve Jobs did not know what, how that happened. When people asked him, he was like, man, I was in this one class. And I did not know how I was going to relate to me making computers, but I was in this one class. I just want to tell you in, in leaving that God places us in classes. God places us in lessons that sometimes are so difficult, sometimes are so pressing to us. And sometimes we ask ourselves, man, why is this so, why is this in my life? Because right now I'm looking at it, it's so irrelevant to me being a doctor. It's so irrelevant to me helping out you. It's so irrelevant to me being a teacher. It's so irrelevant for me being an elder. I don't see God why you have this in my life. It's like you just popped it right there and I just got to go through trials because I'm a Christian. I just got to go through trials just because I'm a Christian. But God uses those situations because one day somebody's going to say, man, you minister in a different way. Why do you minister like that? Man, you love in a different way. Why do you love people like that? How do you talk to people like that? 
and you'll be like, man, I took this one class. I took this one class called being a single parent. I took this one class called having no money and unemployment. I took this one class called disappointment and rejection. I took this one class called having all your friends betray you. I took this one class called a family, a loved one dying. I took this one class called all my dreams being crushed. I took this one class and Moses took this one class. It was a long class. But that one class helped him out amazingly to be an amazing leader. It humbled him. And so now when God brings Moses through Moses has a mission, but Moses is one of the people, one of the main people with this mission in his mind that knows the language of the Egyptians. Not only does he know the language of the Egyptians, but he can connect with the Israelites. Not only can he connect with the Israelites, but he's worked in the field as a shepherd and things like that. He knows what hard work is. When somebody comes to him, they're like, man, like, how are we going to make it through this wilderness? You'll make it. Because I made it. And I made it through. Watch out for those insects. Watch out for that. Watch out for those insects. Man, how do you know about those? I, I never seen those before. I know, I know. I saw those a few years back. I saw those a few years back. And you guys are going to have to bundle up. You guys are going to have to bundle up. It's about to get really cold in a little bit. Man, how do you know this stuff? I've been there. I've been there. Because of the class God allowed Moses to take, he was equipped to help other people through the wilderness. And I want to talk to you about this story about my destiny in the desert. Because, man, many of us right now during this time, we're talking about people being liberated. We talk about, you know, Black History Month and things like that. However, I really want to shift the focus on us being liberated. I think so many times in black history we think about the history and we never take that and translate it into our own lives. We're modern day, we're modern day Martin Luther Kings, modern day Malcolm X's. We're modern day leaders and heroes. And so I present to you guys that it's a lot of people that are under slavery. They're under slavery to a sin, a struggle, a habit, something they're going through and they cannot get themselves out. And I don't know exactly what you went through. I don't know what you're going through right now. But I'm here to tell you that what you're going through right now may be just that equipment needed to help them out. Each and every one of us in here are liberators. And we're liberators greater than something, something to something much greater than slavery physical slavery, but the slavery of sin. I have a story that, man, you guys can tell. You guys have a story that I can tell. And so with that being said, if you want to turn your desert situation into a destiny situation, I just ask you guys to bow your heads. We'll pray about that thing. We'll ask God to change our perspective on that thing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you. You said we found our destiny in the desert. Going through the life of Moses, we've come to realize, man, that sometimes you do amazing things through situations that we do not immediately expect. I don't know what we have gone through. Divorce, discouragement, prison time, so many different things can be a factor, God. We know, though that you are using those things for the right equipment to change our lives, Lord God, and change others' lives. So I ask God that you please allow us to look at our desert experience, whether the one we're going through presently or the one we've went through in the past as experiences so we can help others out. At times when we've never spoken up about a situation or a habit that we struggle with, God, because we felt like we would be embarrassed if we talked about it, God, allow us to talk to somebody who needs that information who need to know that somebody else went through that situation, God. 
Allow us to be able to walk out of the wilderness so we can grab the hand of somebody who's been in bondage and walk them through the wilderness, God. And be there right through them, God. Right, right there by them, God. God, continue um, to show us and correct our perspective, God, on how our desert situations really is. Pray these things in Jesus' name.